Ontario is blessed with three bountiful wine-producing regions holding our own on the world's viticulture stage. But what the seasons deliver is changing around the world, and that means the grapes we grow could also change. Joining us now for more on what will be going into Ontario wine bottles in future, Barry Smith. He is Professor Emeritus of Geography at the University of Guelph. And as we welcome you back here to TVO, I thought we'd just start by having you follow up on something you may have heard in the last interview. In particular, the fact that if our climate warms, that will necessarily be good because we'll be able to start growing things here that a cold climate wouldn't allow for. What do you think? If uh, climate change was only change in temperature, and if every year we got average temperature, which we obviously never get, you'd expect that there'd be opportunities in Canada. I mean, because there's limits with the amount of land further north and what have you. But the reality is uh, that we get variations from year to year, particularly in moisture. And your previous guest noted the importance of moisture. And if we look at what's actually happening in areas that are getting experiencing climate change already. California is a classic case. It's got more heat. It's not good for agriculture there. They're in big trouble. Series of droughts. There's no moisture. There's no moisture. Mm. Australia the same. And the prairies is similar. The constraint on agriculture in the prairies will be moisture. And the idea of, well, we can irrigate, that's a false uh, assumption because the, all of the waters are currently allocated. There's no free more mm. water available and there'll be less actually coming down from the Rockies because the glaciers, once they've uh, melted away even further than they already have, will be generating less water for use in the prairie. So the big cruncher for prairie agriculture is going to be lack of moisture. So and disabuse it, ourselves of the notion that warmer yeah. necessarily means better. Exactly. And similarly, the comparison between west and east. I, uh, there was a, um, the president of the Ontario Corn Producers Association in Ontario was a climate skeptic for a long while. And he actually read the three volumes of the IPCC reports, and he gave a public address, and I went Inter along. Uh, we're tough on uh, acronyms here. The Intergovernmental the, Panel on Climate the Change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate okay. Change. It summarizes all of the science in the world. He read them. It's, it's a, it must have taken him months. Anyway, he gave a public address, and I went along to this, and I, I thought he was going to say, ah, it's all nonsense. He said, if you were a young person in Ontario thinking of going into farming, don't do it unless you can guarantee your water supply for the next 50 years. Hmm. So even advice. in Ontario, someone in the business, a farmer, uh, says be careful about the availability of moisture. Okay, with that, let's go on and talk about wine. We start, I'm going to start this interview the same way I started the last one, which is what are some of the conditions that wine grapes need to be grown beautifully? Wine grapes need um, sunny days, warm Sunny That's days. It's a very funny choice of expression, <laughs> given sunny ways given and who sunny the, days. Who the new prime minister is? Uh, okay. Uh, so it's going to be good, um, but not hot, but not too hot. Uh, you need cool nights, but not too cool. In fact, sometimes they call it the Goldilocks zone. Uh, you need a little bit of water, but not too much water. Uh, and you need um, you need cold winters, so there's a dormant period for the grapes but not too cold so that it kills off the vines and the, and the rootstock. Um, uh, you need well-drained soils as well, but the key constraint is the other climatic conditions. And we can think of grapes liking a Mediterranean type climate, generally dry, sun and, and warm in the daytime, not too hot. That's why you don't find grapes in the tropics, not too wet. You don't find it in grapes in temperate regions and not too cold, you don't find it in the far north or the far south. But we kind of hit the sweet spot here in southern Ontario, is that right? Uh, we're, yeah, we, we, we have some uh, places in Ontario which uh, satisfy those conditions, yep. Hmm. How is climate change expected to affect all of those things you just listed? Well, if you're in a, an area that um, is already quite hot and you're growing the, the, the warm uh, zone grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot uh, and you get more warmth you may be in trouble so in southern Napa for example you can grow uh, grapes there but if you go to the central valley of California you're growing raisins it's too hot mm. so people who are growing grapes in the areas that are already quite warm they may have trouble if you're in the cooler parts you may be able to switch to different varieties maybe able to switch from Riesling the cooler climate ones to the Cabernet Sauvignon. But that's an investment you'd have to make. 
Um, so there'll be some areas that will likely go out of production and some areas that will probably come into production. New areas will become available. And, of course, there'll be the, uh, the constraint of water as well in mm -hmm. any of those places. But as each sector in the agricultural world looks at how climate change may affect what it does, would you imagine the impact of climate change on the wine business to be greater or lesser than other sectors? Um, I don't... You, at first blush, we might think it would be beneficial because most wine growers would like a bit more heat. Um, but I think there's going to be areas that will benefit and be able to realise opportunities from this, but other areas are going to be in trouble. You want to speculate on which is which? Well, you don't have to speculate. It's already happening. Um, you can, uh, if you go to uh, southern Napa, they're already pulling up grapes too hot. Southern uh, South Africa, Australia. So how about here? How about uh, like Prince Edward County, for example, oh, or Niagara on the Lake? What oh, are the... Well, in, in Ontario, um, probably we'll have a, a moderate benefit. Um, uh, Prince Edward County would probably benefit from a little bit more warmth. Ontario, the North Erie Shore would probably benefit. But you have to be careful. There's other things that come along with, um, uh, with climate change. For example, one of the key uh, products in Ontario is ice wine. Mm -hmm. Ice wine is the uh, wine that's known internationally for Canada, and Ontario is the major producer. It's a huge. It's, We're uh, among the best in the world at it. Best in the world. It's, uh, ice wine is 30% of Canadian mm -hmm. export in wine. Now, in order to have ice wine, you leave the grapes on the vine until winter, and you have to wait until uh, the temperature is minus 8 degrees Celsius. And what happens is the, the grapes freeze and it concentrates the flavour. Now, with climate change, the time at which you get minus 8 degrees is becoming later and later. You mm. used to be able to harvest them around Christmas, maybe. Now you're into early January, now into... The longer you leave it, the, more, the less material you're able to uh, harvest. And the number of days at minus 8 degrees is becoming fewer and fewer. So is it possible in the future we don't get to minus 8 at all and this whole industry is wiped out? It's entirely possible that, uh, that the ice wine industry will be in big trouble hmm. and may have to, have to shift. And, and moving, changing production in, in wine is a big investment. It's not like an annual crop, you just plant something different. Hmm. You have to prepare the land, you have to... Uh, the grapes take several years to get established. You usually expect once you've established the vines that you're going to have them for 50 years or 100 years. How about in uh, British Columbia? Some great wines out of the Okanagan. What, what's the prospect there? Uh, similar. In the southern uh, Okanagan, uh, around a soyus, that's hot. And the, so they produce those big fruity reds. Now, if that gets even hotter, they're going to have trouble. In the central and northern part, uh, there may be some benefits. You might have to swap varieties. Um, but again, they've got water problems. They're having already difficulty in getting enough water for use. And they've got fires too, which is uh, affecting their, their production and uh, their marketing. Sure. Let me read something out of the Guardian newspaper. This is uh, admittedly a couple of years old already, but um, it still stands. Here we go. Bid adieu to Bordeaux, but also quite possibly a hello to Chateau Yellowstone. Researchers predict a two-thirds fall in production in the world's premier wine regions because of climate change. The study forecasts sharp declines in wine production from Bordeaux and Rhone regions in France, Tuscany in Italy, and Napa Valley in California, and Chile by the year 2050, as a warming climate makes it harder to grow grapes in traditional wine country. But also anticipate a big push into areas once considered unsuitable. That could mean more grape varieties from northern Europe, including Britain the U.S. Northwest, and the hills of central China. Do you sign on to that prognostication? Sure. Um, and there's evidence of that happening already. I already mentioned that they're pulling up grapes... In Napa. In Napa yeah. and other places. Um, in Chile, it so happens that uh, one of the major producers there, Torres, uh, is already, uh, has already purchased and planted vines um, on slopes higher up the mountain, because it's cooler, and further south. In the southern hemisphere, the further south you go, the cooler it gets, in anticipation of this. Um, the uh, uh, recent last week, there was the outcome of an international uh, champagne competition. You can't call it champagne unless it's grown it's in champagne. France, right. So, uh, but uh, sparkling Chardonnay from all over the world had a competition. Um, guess where the winner was from? Having a clue. It wasn't from France, wasn't from Italy, wasn't from Spain, wasn't from California, from Sussex, England. No kidding. 
So you wouldn't this have is guessed a, that. You would never have guessed that, and all of the people there recognise that this is because climate change is allowing that to happen. Can you imagine a day then, and maybe you could tell me how far in the future, are we 25, 50 years away from this, where, and I think 25 to 50 years ago, there was no wine industry in Prince Edward County, two hours east of this studio. Is it possible we're going to be seeing a wine industry in Sudbury or North Bay or Renfrew County or something like that? <laughs> I was thinking about this on the way in because it's an obvious uh, question to ask. Um, one of the reasons that Ontario and even Okanagan is able to have its, uh, its wine produced successfully is the moderating influence of, influence of large water bodies. Mm -hmm. So if we go further north, we'd probably still want to look for uh, the areas that have well-drained soils, good sunlight, not a lot of rain if you can help it, but uh, more heat. I don't know, maybe um, around Bruce Peninsula or somewhere. So after this interview, people will be buying land in Bruce Peninsula <laughs> and planting grapes. Oh, but look, at Sudbury's got a lake right in the middle of the city. You've got beautiful uh, yeah. open skies and sunny days there. Things could happen. You never know. Now, one of the interesting things in, in, in Europe about climate change and the areas where it's grown, you mentioned you can only call it Chardonnay if it's grown in that region. Mm. Burgundy. Uh, Burgundy is, uh, red Burgundy is uh, the wine made from Pinot Noir, one of the famous wines of all time. Mm. But it can only be called Burgundy if, if it's grown in the Appellation of Burgundy, that particular region. Mm. Um, and yet Pinot Noir is grown the world over. Uh, now what's happening with climate change in, the, in this district of Burgundy is that in the southern part, it's getting too hot. And so the wine is actually not that good. It's a bit too fruity mm. and not balanced. To the area north of the Burgundy official region, they're actually growing Pinot Noir and making superb wine, but they can't call it Burgundy. So here we have a physical change in where you can grow good Pinot Noir, but the institutional arrangement doesn't allow that to shift. Whereas mm. in the New World, we have a lot more flexibility on what we can call uh, our grapes where they're grown. So they're going to have to change all of the regulations around that? I don't know how they're going to handle it, but it's a, it's a huge thing because they protect those names like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. Help me with a, I am not an enophile, so you're going to have to help me with some of the terminolo terminology here. Terroir, is that how you say it? Terroir, oui. Terroir? <laughs> yeah. Okay, monsieur. Which means what? Terroir refers to the, the distinct characteristics of, uh, of a site. It relates to what sort of temperature it gets, uh, what sort of cool nights, what sort of wind, what sort of humidity, uh, amount of sunlight, amount of shade. Um, it refers to uh, the difference between the day and the night time. It refers to aspect. Is it north facing or south facing? Because that'll affect the growing conditions. It refers to the soil. The minerality, the drainage characteristics, all of those things together create s distinct characteristics for the wine. So a classic example of this would be um, Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc grown in Loire, Sancerre, in France, in France uh, has the distinct Sauvignon Blanc characteristics, tropical fruits and, and grassiness, but it's, it's elegant and delicate in its style, very French. Now, if you have exactly the same grape grown from even the same rootstock in Marlborough, New Zealand, it has the same general flavour, that is tropical fruits and grass, but it's, it's robust, it's, it's powerful, it's like the rugby team, it's <laughs> in your face. <laughs> so it's the same grape but has completely different characteristics because of the, the terroir. And that can even be short distances. So if you go to Niagara, if you get a Riesling grown on uh, the Beamsville bench, that'll taste quite different and have different characteristics from the same grape grown down on Niagara Lakeshore, for example. So Ontario does have a particular terroir that is recognized around the continent oh, or certainly. around the world? Um, but not only Ontario, within Ontario. Hmm. I mean, so so uh, Prince Edward County has, has different uh, characteristics than than Niagara and Lakeshore. Now, they'll, they'll choose somewhat different grapes to match the site, but even within Niagara, from one of the various sub-appellations that exist in Niagara, you'll get different flavours uh, from the grapes. Now, of course, there are also differences due to the viticultural management and, and the wine production techniques, but certainly the land has an effect. What do you think grape-growing regions, like the ones you've mentioned here in the province of Ontario, are going to need in the future in order to continue to be successful? 
Well, one of the things about the wine industry is they've actually bought into the climate change. They accept that internationally they're doing all sorts of things. I mentioned they're already buying land and planting. Uh, they're buying up water rights. Some of them in Europe are making huge underground reservoirs for water. Um, they're looking ahead to where they might uh, plant new crops, um, uh, new varieties. Uh, and in Ontario, would need to do that as well. They'd need to look at uh, are the particular varieties that I have in this location, are they going to do well under this changing climate? Um, should I be changing them? Should I try and expand this area or that area? It makes sense to look at your the, the constraints that are going to come to bear on you and the opportunities that exist. We have an awful lot of fresh water around us here, particularly you know, Lake Ontario, obviously, but then just go an hour and a half north, Lake Simcoe, for example. If you want to go even further north, you can talk about James Bay. Does, is any of that helpful as you look 25 or 50 years down the road? Well, for grape growing, it, 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 there's moisture is probably not the same constraint as it is in, say, Okanagan. Most of the grape growing regions of the world are almost deserts. You know, Mediterranean, uh, California, a lot of these places are deserts and water is really at a premium. So that's probably not going to be the crucial uh, constraint uh, in Ontario. It's probably going to be other things. Now, the, the, there's things like the timing of the conditions. The apple crop in Ontario in 2012 is an excellent example. Um, with warmer climate, we're getting spring coming earlier. And in 2012, we got a very warm period early on. The apple trees blossomed. Hmm. Um, but then we got a frost, not an untimely frost, but a frost that came at a regular time, but after the blossoms were out, devastated the Ontario apple crop. Something like 80% of the crop was lost, millions of dollars, simply because there was a change in timing. So a lot of the things about climate change are very underpredictable like that. Hmm. We have to do one last thing, and that is satisfy our viewing public's curiosity about where you're from. Because they're going to assume that accent is an Aussie accent, and it's not quite, is it? No, I grew up in New Zealand. My father was born in southern Alberta <laughs> and uh, was, was on a farm there. And during the droughts of the 1930s, uh, they didn't have crop insurance and safety nets. They had to leave the farm. And my dad, as a youngster, uh, ended up in Vancouver and went to New Zealand. So I grew up in New Zealand, and years later, I came back here. Welcome back to Canada. Thank you very much. Good stuff. That's Barry Smith, University of Guelph. Thanks so much for this tonight, Barry. You're very welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.